All right. We want to welcome you tonight to BBI. Thank you for the good time of prayer we just had. And uh, uh, welcome the students there in Stanford, Nebraska. Their pastors with us tonight here, uh, live and in person somewhere. I believe visiting his grandmother. So uh, I want you to pray uh, God to uh, touch there and meet the need there and help them. And uh, then also all the other requests tonight. Uh, take your Bibles, turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter number 4, verse 2. I want you to see that, and uh, uh, this is a, a very good verse. I've heard several messages preached from it. Matter of fact, an older preacher that I dearly love preached from this years ago and uh, preached it for a homecoming. I never forgot it. I got a copy of the message at the house, and uh, I love to hear uh, this man of God preach. And uh, any time that we're preaching or teaching, we don't want to give them, thus saith somebody else, we want to give them, thus saith the Lord. Amen. The Bible says here in Proverbs 4, 2, For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. Think about that. Good doctrine. And uh, we're going to talk about the expository sermon tonight. And uh, this is one of the best ways in order to uh, instruct people to build uh, Christian lives, I believe, that you'll find. You say, well, what is expository preaching? Well, we'll, we'll talk about that in the lesson tonight, try to learn that, try to learn some things tonight that will help you to uh, get the Word of God in your Sunday school class, uh, from the pulpit, wherever your uh, position is, that uh, you might reach souls for Christ. Let's uh, have a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into the lesson. Father, I pray tonight you'll help me. I pray that you'll uh, give uh, guidance and direction. Lord, I want to be a blessing tonight. I pray you'll open the hearts of our students tonight to, uh, to hear and to learn and to grow. And God, uh, what we hear and learn, we'll put to use for your glory, that souls will be saved and Christ will be uplifted. Help us now, and we'll be careful to give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Out of all the types of sermons that we've studied, I believe the expository is the most difficult. Uh, it has been proven that expository preaching builds the strongest Christians. Uh, that's what you want. You want good, strong Christians in your church. You want uh, uh, families in your church. Strong families makes a strong church. And uh, by the way, that's the only two uh, institutions that God ordained. Amen? Mm -hmm. uh, one in Genesis and then the church uh, in the New Testament. So uh, we need to stick with that. And, you know, uh, it, it's been said they may have been uh, a greater expositor who was not a great preacher, but there's never been a great preacher that was not a great expositor. So, uh, in other words, uh, teaching them the Word. And while there may be problems in the pews, uh, too much life situation preaching is done, and too much problem preaching is done, and uh, it is not the kind of steady diet uh, to grow on. Uh, now, I like to eat, and uh, you can tell that by looking at me. I weigh a little bit over 200. Not much over 200, but a little bit. And uh, I like to eat, but i got to watch what I eat. got to watch it because of cholesterol. got to watch it because of blood pressure and uh, all sugar and all these other things. But uh, I have to have a steady diet. And uh, if you're a Christian, you have to have a steady diet in the Word of God. And so uh, uh, just uh, problem preaching is not going to make you uh, complete in your meal. You're not going to have a complete menu. And uh, you're only getting maybe some of the appetizers. Maybe you're only getting some of the things that would be harmful for you. You say you get things that are harmful for you from the Word of God. Yeah, if uh, somebody preaches on the same message all the time and harps on that until they get you out of church, uh, you're in trouble. So uh, you need the steady diet of the Word of God. Now, the preacher who uses the textual and topical sermons exclusively forms uh, to address problems he perceives that uh, and will neglect needed areas of the truth of the Bible. And you say, preacher, what are you talking about? Well, if I know of a problem in the church uh, and I design a message just for that problem, I'm preaching to that individual. And that's not what God wants us to do. God wants us to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. God wants us to preach the whole counsel of the Word of God. And if I preach the whole counsel of the Word of God, somewhere along the line what will take place 
is God's Word will penetrate that heart and meet the need of that problem, and it's not me preaching to that problem that will reach it. It's God. And so we depend upon Him. We look to Him. You say, well, preacher, how can you be so sure of that? <clears throat> well, I go back to what Hebrews 4.12 says. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of sunder of the soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's Word is what changes us. God's Word is what builds us. God's Word is what meets our needs and comforts us. So we depend upon that. And uh, expository sermons, while lacking nothing from the standpoint of uh, relevance, carries authority, and uh, that authority uh, is uh, something that's lacking in a lot of sermons. Now, uh, I like to preach glory sermons. I don't, uh, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about or not, but I like glory sermons. But you can't preach glory sermons all the time and uh, build a church. And so uh, we have to preach the whole Word of God. And in expository preaching, answers to everyday problems and trials we face pierces the heart of the people, and uh, they're hearing the Word of God expounded, and it touches and grabs them, and it changes them. Uh, I can't change anybody. I've, uh, I've come to that decision a long time ago. Uh, I'm just to preach the Word of God. And uh, you say, Preacher, you ever been guilty of... Uh, preaching to people? Yeah, I have in, in a way that I shouldn't have and there's probably not a preacher in here if you're called to preach that hasn't done that. Uh, we, uh, we're flesh. But we need to stay away from the flesh and uh, we need to follow God. Uh, here we learn where to turn for help and find answers to their problems. That's in the Word of God. And, and we want to look at uh, the things that make up an expository sermon tonight and uh, the preaching that makes it uh, so valuable. Uh, number one, we're going to look at the definition of an expository. Uh, from the Latin, ex, ex, uh, we find the word out, and from the word puno, uh, to place. So it means to place, out, or exhibit. And the expositor or preacher is displacing, uh, displaying the truth uh, that is uh, continued in a passage of Scripture. That's why it's so important to keep Scripture in context. Okay? That's, a lot of people take one verse of Scripture and try to build a, a doctrine off of that, and you can't do that. That's why you read the Scriptures before and the Scriptures after. Uh, I had the opportunity to preach down in Statesville this week, and uh, the pastor down there, I've uh, filled in for him a couple times, and uh, he always sends me the Sunday school lesson. He does expository teaching in the Sunday school. He, he teaches himself, and that's a good idea, I think, for a new church. Pastor ought to be able to teach his people and, and show them what's right, get them rooted and grounded. And so we, uh, we were in Ephesians chapter 4, and he said, uh, Brother said, I only left you three verses. Well, man, I got to study those three verses out, and he left me the cream out of the chapter. <laughs> and uh, I could have preached or taught for probably three or four hours on, on just those three verses. Uh, but I had a short period of time, and I had to get as much out as I could. And uh, so uh, it helps build the people. And that's what you want to do. You've got to get it out there. You've got to display the Word of God. And usually this is done in less than a paragraph in length. <clears throat> now, by, by giving expository uh, preaching and by giving ex exposition of the Scripture uh, in this manner, it enables the hearer to remember the truth of that passage. Now, I've learned something over the years. Uh, years ago, when I did my student teaching as a public school teacher, I had to sit and watch and observe my teacher as he uh, conducted the class. And he said, now I want you to watch what I do. Of course, again, this is back, and I, I think I mentioned this to you, this was back when the Commodore 64 was coming out. And uh, he said, these young'uns are raised on video games and TV. He said, you've got to move here, you've got to move there, you've got to get loud here, you've got to get soft there. And he said, you've got to feed them just little bits at a time. Paul told one church, he said, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. Right. So you've got to learn to feed as uh, you can to meet the needs of the people. 
And attention spans of most people are not very long. So you want to give uh, it to them in a way that is easy to remember. How many of you here teaches a Sunday school class? Anybody? One, two, three. Okay. Now, most of the time, kids don't go to sleep. But if you've got young adults, <clears throat> you've got older people, I guarantee you, you'll see this. Yeah. <laughs> or, <laughs> that's when they go plumb out. And uh, you've got to keep their attention, and you've got to feed them small bits, and you've got to move, and you've got to do things that will encourage them. So remember that uh, you've got to meet the needs of those people that you're preaching to. And 90% of the time, you'll only have them for a span of anywhere from 35 to 45 minutes at the most. And uh, that's probably the only Bible they'll get that week. You thought about that? I, this is one of my pet peeves. I hate to walk through a parking lot and look in the back window of a car and there lays the Bible with the covers turned up from the sun or the sun's beat on it. And you know they throw it back there when they left church and it's going to be there when they go back to church. They've never read it any time during the week. I've got to have my diet every day. I've got to have the Word of God every day. And uh, we need that. And a lot of people don't. Now, <clears throat> other definitions of expository preaching. And this is probably question number one. In preaching, <coughs> exposition is the detailed interpretation of lo uh, logical ap amplification and practical application of a passage of Scripture. Uh, I heard one of the greatest messages out of uh, Genesis 45 last night. Dr. Rudy Smith uh, preached on the wagons coming out of Egypt to go get uh, Jacob. And he started out, he had two little minor points, but he got down to the last point. First point was uh, uh, wagons of royalty. And they were. They were sent by the king. And then he went on and explained about that just a little bit. And he got down to the third point. He said, the third point said, these are wagons of reality. He said, I'm glad I've got something that's real. Yeah. And he's talked about uh, the realness of salvation. Change. You get, you get saved, you're going to get changed. Amen. And just in that little passage of Scripture, I mean, he, he gave uh, probably uh, uh, seven or eight things uh, on wagons of reality. Reality of salvation, reality of the Holy Ghost, uh, reality of prayer, and uh, reality of healing, right on down the line. And uh, I want to tell you, uh, it's something that you can relate to. And if you can't relate to it, uh, you better, better check where you're standing. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. Well, salvation's real. Mm -hmm. It's real. Now, consider the expository sermon like a wheel. The main theme is the hub. The main theme is the hub. That's what holds everything together. The contributing thoughts shedding light on the theme are the spokes. And the application to practical living is the rim that makes the motion possible. Now, can I teach you something right here? God ought to be the center of your life. Amen. And He's the hub. He holds everything together. And you need to take those spokes and divide family, church, time alone with God, Pleasure, hobbies, different things into those spokes. And before you go from one to the other, go always go back to God. Always go back to God in prayer before you enter in that next spoke to that wheel. And I want to tell you, it'll keep you. Anybody ever heard this term? This old country term. Anybody ever heard wobble on the shaft? <laughs> Tower gets out of balance, it wobbles on the shaft. You won't wobble on the shaft. Right. You'll keep God at the center of all you're doing. Right. He's got to be there. So think about that. The hub, the spokes, and the ring. The second thing tonight, the definite advantages of expository sermons. It puts the supreme emphasis, and I think that's number three, on the Word of God. Hey, 
The Word is to be magnified. The Word is to be magnified. Listen to what Psalm 138, 2 says. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Now you say, preacher, how is that possible? Well, think about who the word is. Yes. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Amen. So he's magnifying the word of God. He's magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, he's going to have a name that's above every name. Mm -hmm. That in his name, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. So we want to get the, the supreme emphasis on the word of God. Now, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with humor in a sermon. Uh, sometimes that gets people's attention and that uh, makes them relate to you. I don't think there's anything wrong with using illustrations. We talked about that in another uh, lesson. But you can have too much humor and you can have too many illustrations and not enough of the Word of God. Uh, I don't want to hear a comedian. <clears throat> if I go to church, I want to be fed. If I go to church, I want to hear the Word of God. If I go to church, I want something that's going to help my life. And man, I'll tell you what, uh, I got some help last night because I could relate to every situation that he talked about last night. And uh, I've had the, the prayer of healing. I've seen that in my life. I've had the prayer of not having enough and God supply the need. I've had the, uh, the Holy Ghost move upon me at times and, and just fill me. And I just, you know, I, I wanted to just say, God, that's enough. Hold back. You're going to kill me. Uh, it's real. It's real. It's a reality. And so we looked at him. Now, it demands direct contact with the Scripture. In 2 Timothy 4, 2, it says this, Preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Hey, uh, it demands direct contact with the Scripture. He didn't say preach about the Word. He didn't say preach on the Word. Okay? He said, preach the Word. And uh, God doesn't uh, you know, put things in the Scripture that He doesn't want us to hear and to understand. So, uh, right up here, Miss Megan. You can have this middle chair there next to Arnold. He don't need an armrest in the You get too comfortable, he'll go to sleep during my, my teaching. Amen. We're to preach the Word of God. And what we're to do it for is to edify. If I'm not going to edify the people that I'm speaking to and edify the body of Christ, then I've missed my point. It edifies the people as the Scriptures are applied to their everyday life. 1 Corinthians 14.3 says this, But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. When the Word of God is preached and it's preached to... Uh, uh, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, it may be cutting Brother Rodney back yonder, but over here, it may be comforting Sister Kim. Mm -hmm. You never know. And uh, that's what happens when the Word of God's preached. Take a couple of them, brother. I think this thing needs one too. That's what happens when the Word of God is preached and the Word of God is taught. And so it's the Word that makes the difference. Uh, number four, you might want to write this down. It makes for a broad knowledge of the Bible. It makes for a broad knowledge of the Bible. When I first got saved, you could write everything I knew on the back of a postage stamp. And when I got saved, they were only three cents. So they were small. And so... One of the things that I wanted to do, I wanted to learn. I wanted to grow. The little church that I started attending only had about uh, 20 folks in it at the most. And I went there on a Wednesday night and we were having a prayer meeting and uh, the preacher was sick and he didn't show up and somebody handed uh, uh, me a, a piece of paper and said, <clears throat> Brother Tony, we want you to teach the class tonight. And I said, where are you teaching? He said, it's on that paper there. And I looked at it and it was in the book of Acts. Well, I couldn't 
could barely quote John 3.16. <laughs> Hadn't been saved but a couple months. And I looked at that and I read where they were wanting to teach from. And I thought, I can't teach this, Lord. I, I don't know how. And uh, so I, I got up and I read the scripture and I told them, I said, what we're going to do is we're going to have prayer and we're going to go to the house. And I said, I, I want to tell you what you're going to do. I said, now, I'm not telling you how to run your church. I'm not even a member here yet. But I said, I've got to have preaching. And I said, our preacher's sick and he's leaving. This was in November. They was, he was leaving the end of December. I said, we need, we need a preacher. We need a preacher. And so they got a pulpit committee together and got to working and laboring to do that. And uh, it was March before we ever got a preacher. You know how pulpit committees are. They move kind of slow. <laughs> but there was a little fireball preacher come in there. And man, he began to preach the Word of God and people began to get saved. And I, I joined the church and uh, uh, got baptized. And man, we was clicking along. We went from uh, about 20 to about 160 in nine months' time. I mean, God was blessed. And uh, they asked me to, to be a deacon. I served a year in the deacon's office. He's getting ready to ordain me. And God told me to preach. Hey, it takes a steady diet of the Word of God. And that's what that young preacher gave us. And, uh, boy, I grew. And I began to study. They had me teaching a Sunday school class. And I was teaching folks that was older, uh, you know, they, they'd been saved longer than I was old. And that's hard. Because they know the Bible. They've studied the Bible. And some of them, I mean, faithful people. And uh, so I had to study. And so uh, you get a broad knowledge of the Bible when you uh, have expository teaching and preaching. Uh, for the preacher in the fact that he will have to preach the whole counsel of the Word of God. For the people, the relationship of each part of the Scripture will reveal the whole counsel of God's Word uh, for them to see. And that's what you want. You want them to see the Word of God. Now, here's another thing. It provides opportunity to preach the passages otherwise neglected. You know, I, I love to go and hear different preachers because they'll, they'll bring out texts that uh, I never thought about preaching. Mm -hmm. And I'll see things in that text once he brings it out that I know the Holy Ghost is revealed. And, uh, you know, you say, preacher, do, do you ever use them? Absolutely. Man's a fool who won't take another man's stick and beat the devil. <laughs> Amen. BJ's on the sheriff's department back there. If his bullets will shoot my gun, I'm going to get some. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, you know, uh, we need to understand that God gave all the Word of God. Uh, I'll tell you what, when I get to reading those begets and begots, now that bothers me. Uh, I, it gets kind of boring. But when you come into the New Testament and you begin to see the genealogy and why God put all that in the Old Testament and you read history along with it, you understand that God was keeping this book pure and the line pure so that the line of the tribe of Judah could come. Amen. And so it's all important. God don't put anything in there just take up space. Amen? Amen. Matter of fact, 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17 says this, all Scripture... All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished, and all good works. And many passages of Scripture are missed or neglected or given little attention. Uh, it was a long time before I ever heard anybody preach out of the book of uh, uh, Philemon. And when he preached out of it, he called it the book of Philemon. I thought that was kind of funny. But that's where he was from. That's just the way he pronounced it. But man, he began to teach that little book and I thought, man, what things has come out of that little book that you know we've neglected? So we need to teach the whole counsel of the Word of God. And uh, you know, uh, I'm guilty just like any other preacher. We want to preach something that's sensational sometimes and not what God wants us to preach. So uh, we better be careful. We better listen to God, take His advice. And the reason so many passages of Scripture became familiar to us is because somebody sought to preach all of the Word of God. 
That's how they become familiar. And, you know, when you hear Scripture over and over and over again, it begins to set in your mind. Uh, I like to read it. Uh, I try to read through the Bible twice a year if I can possibly do it. I get through it once at least, but most of the time, two times a year. And so uh, you need that Word of God. There will be a variety in this kind of preaching. You know, when, when we say variety, we mean that we won't become Johnny One Notes. Like I said, preaching on one, one subject all the time. Expository preaching prevents neglect or overemphasis of one truth. And again, you can beat somebody over the head all you want to with that one truth and you're trying to shake them up. What you're going to do is drive them farther away. You just preach the Word that God gives you or teach the Word that God gives you and let the Word of God do the, the correcting. It's not my job. My job is to preach. My job is to be faithful to get the Word out. It's God's job to get the Word done and to convict the heart and to change that individual. Because if they change for you, it's not going to last very long. But if they change because the Holy Ghost convicted them, hey, it's going to last. And I've seen it. I've seen it happen. Then, three, the dangers in expository sermons. This ought to be number about number... No, I, I skipped one. Let me back up and get number nine. Well, let me get number eight. I missed it. It will prevent the abuse. Did I get number seven? No, oh, got to get number seven. How about six? All right. We'll, we'll start with six. Y'all want to start with six? I'm here five. Hey, I've been in church day and night since Sunday morning, so. It enables one to deal with current evils. Evil practices. Okay? Evil practices which would otherwise uh, be too pointed or personal uh, and can be addressed and, and reproved in this way. An old preacher told me one time this. He said, Preacher, don't ever preach anything that you haven't taught from the pulpit on a Wednesday night or in a Sunday school class on Sunday. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he said, you could address things like separation." Here's where you leave a lot of Baptists. Okay? On separation. He said you can teach on separation and you can uh, study on separation in your Wednesday night Bible study and said if you'll just let God at the right time tell you what to hammer on and you hammer on that in that particular message, he said God will take care of it and he'll meet the need of that individual that needs to change. So be careful. Uh, we can touch current evils. Uh, it cannot be alleged that the preacher singled anyone out. Uh, the Bible will be shown to be rele relevant to the day. I've seen three posts this week that uh, said, made this statement. This book is unfolding itself right before our eyes and nobody's seen it. And it is. Uh, you know, you say, preacher, you're you're going to depress me now talking about the, the world situation. No, I'm I'm not going to be here. <laughs> if you're saved, you're not going to be here. Right. We're going to be in heaven. Uh, it'll prevent isolated texts. These texts will be uh, in the proper setting, and uh, their real meaning will be accepted and appreciated. And then uh, number eight, uh, it is nearly impossible to rest or to take out a text uh, or take it out of context when forced to interpret it in the confine of the context. And then, of course, we gave you that little quote last time, any text without context is a pretext. So keep everything in context. And expository preaching does that. It will furnish the preacher with enough material for a lifetime. Somebody asked me, well, have you got a message for this week? And, and I say, why, well, yeah. But where are you going to preach from? The Bible. <laughs> well, it's got 66 books. There's bound to be something there I can find. Amen. But too many people, well, you know, I, I just don't know what I'm going to preach this week. I, I really haven't had time to study. Well, that's your fault. You know, be careful. Uh, it will furnish the preacher, again, with enough material for a lifetime. Topical preaching requires imagination and inventiveness. 
imagination and inventiveness. That's number nine. And many years are required in order to preach through the Bible verse by verse. Anybody know Marvin Blackburn? Amen. You know how many years he's been preaching? Fifty-six years. The other morning, Monday morning, yesterday morning, he kicked off our camp meeting. He was sitting back there, just minding his own business, and me and him talking. And the moderator come down out of the pulpit with a clip mic, and he acted like he was going one direction, and then he walked over and he handed to Brother Blackburn, and he said, you're on. <laughs> You've got uh, 30 minutes to preach before the main speaker comes. Brother Blackburn said, me? And he said, yeah. And I want to tell you, he got up there. He got uh, over there in Exodus, and he got to preaching about uh, going into Canaan's land. And I want to tell you what, he expounded the word. I got some stuff. I, I took a note then. Say, you going to preach that preacher? Absolutely. Somewhere, someday, when the Lord moves them on, I will. I'll use that outline. I'll read, you know, use my own illustrations and all that. But, man, what a job he does. Right. And then the next preacher got up and preached, and it lined right up with what he was preaching. Only God can do that. That's right. That's right. Only God can do that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't have much imagination. I wouldn't like those kids that, you know, they say the smart kids have imaginary friends when they grow up. You girls have any imaginary friends? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have any imaginary friends. The only friend I have is a dog, and he bit me. <laughs> so he wasn't much of a friend. But I think about the years that uh, Brother Blackburn preached, and that helped him to get his thoughts together and depend upon God to preach that sermon. He didn't have the outline. He didn't come prepared to preach. He didn't think he, you know, he didn't come down there and say, well, I come down here, and, well, I hope they call me to preach. Most times you come with that attitude, they're not gonna, God's not going to call you. Okay. So he was just there, and I appreciate it. Uh, it's a proven fact that the rate of progress in verse-by-verse -verse teaching will slow with the years as more and more light is shed from other passages and from experience. Uh, it's amazing how one preacher can look at a verse of Scripture and have an outline and preach from that verse of Scripture, and maybe you'll go six months or a year later and you'll hear another preacher preach on the same Scripture and you'll have something else come out of that. Mm -hmm. That's what makes God's Word alive. Mm -hmm. It's the living Word. Mm -hmm. And so we need to get it out there. The dangers. Now we're going down to number 10. Hallelujah, you finally got there. <laughs> we're getting close to here. Circling the wagons. The, the dangers of inexpository sermons. Disconnecting the part from the whole disconnecting the part from the whole. You say, preacher, explain that. Well, unity is the great aim and the keynote goal uh, in expository preaching. And after a chapter is dissected uh, for preaching, it must be maintained in the relationship that it has to the book from which it is chosen. And in order to maintain this, you need some things. Number one, you need to outline the entire book before the individual chapter or sermon is prepared. You say, preacher, I've never done that. Well, I wish we had about six or seven more weeks to teach this class. Uh, I'd have you do that and have you get up and give you outline. That'd be me, wouldn't it? I hate to give book reports. And uh, it was tough. I always tried to find somebody that already read the book and get what they had, get their <laughs> Y'all wouldn't do anything like that, would you? Misinterpretation and or misapplication. This is number 11. A lack of Bible knowledge will produce this. Misinterpretation or misapplication. A lack of Bible knowledge will produce this. That's what's wrong with a lot of uh, so-called churches in America today. They have made up their own doctrines. They have confused doctrines. Uh, I saw one here not long ago that he's confused... Israel with the church and the church with Israel. They're separate. And study will help you to understand that. And when you study Scripture, you'll find places where 
Jesus is speaking to the Jews in the New Testament and Jesus is speaking to the church in the New Testament. And so you put it in context and you follow it in that direction. So be careful. People will misinterpret. Heard one preacher say one time that he was glad he built uh, the church upon Peter. <laughs> he was teaching out of Matthew 16. And uh, this church was looking at him for a pastor. And uh, I thought, man, I hope they don't vote him in. Uh, if Peter's the rock, then we're in trouble. Amen. Amen. Each book of the Bible must be understood in its historic setting, its thesis, and its relationship to the whole of the Scripture. Now, for instance, in the Old Testament, a lot of times the prophets wrote about the church, but they never mentioned the word church. They had an idea of what it was, but it's like standing on a mountaintop here and looking over here at this mountaintop. They knew it was going to be there somewhere, but there's a lot of valleys and a lot of other mountaintops in between. So uh, God brought it about in His time. And uh, another example is the book of Ecclesiastes. This must be understood from the viewpoint of a lost man's uh, vantage point, uh, not, not a saved man. Uh, a lot of good stuff in the book of Ecclesiastes. Avoiding dangers. One should begin with short, basic books. Uh, Jonah is a short book. Ezra, Philippians, 1 Timothy, and there's a lot of others. Uh, avoid deeply doctrinal or long books until more experienced. The prophets, the book of Romans, Hebrews, Ephesians. Prepare properly. This is to be done in more of a teaching manner. In other words, when the sermon comes out, you, you want it to teach the people something. You want to have a, uh, an application uh, that they can see that practically working in their lives. So, uh, teach the people. And uh, it would be helpful to read expositions from men who are masters at uh, this type of preaching. Uh, Joseph Parker is a good one. Uh, anybody got a copy of Matthew Henry? Okay, he's pretty good till he gets to Revelation. Okay, so watch it there. And you say, what do you do with that? Well, you eat the meat and spit out the bones. Okay. Uh, F.B. Meyer, anybody got any books for him? He's a good expository uh, preacher. Uh, John Butler is one who lives now, and you can get his books now, and he's writing them now while he's living. And I've got several of his, and he's good. Uh, so there are several around. Uh, I like J. Vernon McGee. Uh, he's dead and gone now, but he's a pretty good expositor. Uh, and uh, by the way, he's a Presbyterian. He's not a Baptist. Mm -hmm. But guess what? He's saved. Mm -hmm. He's in heaven. Mm -hmm. And uh, he gives a lot of good stuff. All right. Uh, the fourth thing, development. And this should be question number 12. When preparing for expository preaching, in most cases, no less than one chapter. No less than one chapter. And most of the time, if you're going to expand on any, any length of scriptures, you, you'll only get two or three verses uh, when you're preaching or teaching. And, and usually, you want to, if you're going to do that, do the entire book of the Bible uh, that you have selected and prepare the entire book. And uh, it's a good way to study the Bible. It's a good way to, uh, to uh, learn and grow and gain knowledge. The, the steps to preparing this type of sermon are very unique. Although the structure and the outline may be generally the same as the topical sermon, uh, it's in this section uh, we'll look at the following steps in preparing the expository sermon. Number A, or one, however you want to put it down, if you're right taking notes, gather the preliminary data. Now, uh, a good selection of sources uh, should be Acquire a concordance, a good Bible dictionary, and I recommend the Webster's 1828, because if you get one today, you get a modern translation and you won't get the true meaning of the word. A good Bible encyclopedia, history reference books along with the Bible, and a Bible atlas, studies on the particular time and place, 
reputable commentaries and study books. And that's why you need to build yourself a library. Uh, every Christian ought to have a library. Not just preachers, but every Christian. I like my books. I got them all around the wall. I got me one of them rolling chairs and I can roll right around to them. <laughs> so I like that. And uh, sometimes I get that study and spend anywhere from six to eight hours just like I would on a job and study and prepare. So it, that's what it takes. And uh, I, I've heard people say, well, uh, books aren't important. Well, uh, I happen to read this somewhere. Paul said, bring with thee the books, mm -hmm. but especially the part." Parchments. I wonder what books Paul, Paul was talking about. He he been studying something. Yeah. Amen. I think the parchments was his writings. But he been studying some books. Maybe he had the law. I don't know. Maybe he had some history. But uh, he was studying. That's Second Timothy four twelve b. You'll find that. Uh, I know there's a lot of preachers still around from the old days where you just. Get up there and study and open your mouth and God will fill it. A lot of times He will, hot air. Uh, you need to study. You need to prepare. Uh, this ought to be number 14. We're getting close to the end here, I think. Uh, make a brief analysis of the book. Uh, it's the first thing you should strive to do when you're uh, studying. Make an analysis of the book. You say, well, I don't know how to make an analysis. Well, most of your Bibles, and uh, I like this about the Thompson Chain Link, uh, it has a little analysis of the book in the back. Before I ever begin to study a book, I go and read that, and then I go and I begin to look at the, the, the uh, chapters in context. And uh, so uh, make your own analysis. Sometimes uh, if you uh, have a primary and a secondary emphasis uh, in, in your sermon or your lesson, uh, it might be difficult to, to determine a single theme. And uh, a scripture analysis will help you determine what direction you want to take. It, it'll make the final decision for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Making the scripture analysis is done in three steps. Number one, read the passage to discover the subject or the thing. Number two, and this ought to be on your quiz there, read the passage and divide it into paragraphs. Most of your Bibles uh, have paragraphs in your Bible. That's what that little double bar thing with a little hump out there on the end of it is. Uh, Schofield has uh, pretty good paragraphs. Thompson has pretty good paragraphs. Uh, the only thing I don't like about Schofield, I don't like the notes that are written there. I just don't, I don't like notes. I compare Scripture with Scripture. Okay? Uh, it's a good Bible. A lot of people use them. I've got two. One of them's a study Bible. And uh, so, they're good. Uh, draw out the main topic. Substitute its principal idea, or state its principal idea, I'm sorry, and then state uh, uh, the uh, thought that you want to bring out. And this will establish the main divisions or points. Uh, read each paragraph again, that's the third step, as many times as necessary. I have difficulty, I've always have, of, of getting a clear understanding of things. Some people can read right through it and they can write down everything that's in there. I have to read it a couple times, sometimes three, before I get a real clear understanding. You say, why do you do that? I don't want to mislead anybody. I don't want to mislead anybody. I want to be right. And I want to rightly divide the Word of God. So uh, we want to do that. In this third step, here are some things to look for that will help you. Uh, when you rightly divide the passage for exposition. And I think there's ten of them. I'm going to go through it real quick. Any change in the person speaking or addressed. In other words, if there's more than one person or one nation being spoken to. Many times he's speaking to nations. Any progression or success, successive stages uh, as to time, place, and action. Any numeration of examples or instances. Uh, any cumulative ideas, principles, or teachings. Any pairing, grouping, or parallelism uh, if ideas on the basis of similarity. Any contrast, uh, oppose, opposition, or uh, interchange of ideas. Any 
uh, indication of cause and effect. Uh, the Psalms do that. Proverbs does that. Uh, they have cause and effect. Uh, they, they contrast one another. Any divisions of the whole and into parts as uh, of a body. Paul used that uh, in Corinthians, I think. Any repetition of uh, clauses or phrases or words. Uh, sometimes you'll find double words. Sometimes you'll find them used three times successively. Uh, sometimes you'll find them used over and over in Scripture. John uses the words uh, believe, belief, and so on uh, several times. Uh, any transitional clauses or phrases or words such as therefore, moreover, nevertheless, finally, else, thus, but. I like when you connect the conjunction but with God, but God. And uh, there are several places in the Scripture, boy, you can preach off of that or you can teach off of that, but God, who is able. Amen? So uh, those are all good uh, things to remember. Even if the analysis does not provide a basis uh, for a sermon, outline the, uh, the preparation uh, of it uh, has gonna, uh, is going to be valuable to you. In other words, you'll gain knowledge of the Bible. And, uh, you know, it, it's helped, uh, uh, it has helped toward that uh, saturation uh, which is uh, so necessary and effective and, and accurate for exposition. Uh, we need our lives saturated with the Word. We ought to be people of the book. Then uh, I think number 16 is this, homiletic, homiletical devices. The six rhetorical processes. This will be number 16. I'm going to give it to you here just quickly in a minute. Uh, there are six rhetorical processes that aids uh, in helping uh, develop an expository sermon. These uh, processes are described within six important words that you uh, will need to remember when preparing a sermon or a lesson. Narration. That uh, means to develop in the introduction uh, a historical setting for the passage and uh, the person involved. Have you ever heard a preacher say or a teacher say, I'm going to lay a little background, I'm going to build a little foundation? That's what they're doing. And they're giving you some narration. Uh, interpretation, defining terms. If there's any words that's not clear or that you're going to use over and over that you want the people to dwell on, uh, interpretation. Define those terms, explaining manners and customs. Hey, things were different back in the old days. There's a fellow come to me one time and he said, uh, you don't teach the whole Word of God. I said, what do you mean? He said, the Bible says greet each other with a holy kiss. And he started to kiss me on the cheek and I stepped back and I was going to hit him. <laughs> hey, that was old time custom. I'm living in today. This is a now now. Amen. I don't want nobody slobbering on me. <laughs> Putting forth the truth in terms understandable to the congregation. That's what you want to do in your interpretation. Illustration. Aid the understanding by using what is commonly known to explain what is unfamiliar. Rudy Smith preached a message last year and he borrowed a plumb line from me. And he held that plumb line up and he carried that plumb line, the whole message. And he would refer back to that plumb line every time. And uh, it was a good message, good illustration. Uh, argumentation, the answering of assumed objections uh, within the framework of the sermon that might be raised in the minds of the hearers or those uh, raised by skeptics and Bible deniers. Uh, Atheists hates God. They say He don't exist. But they don't hate the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus. Isn't that amazing? They embrace that. You know why? God's real. God lives. He is God. Amen. <laughs> Exhortation. Exhorting the hearer to adopt or act to act upon the truth under consideration. Uh, get it out there. And, you know, the, the multiple approach here 
consider the passage from various points of view uh, of those involved. Think about what they're thinking about. Let me give you a little example. Uh, the stoning of Stephen. From the standpoint of Stephen, look at it from his standpoint and then uh, think about what Stephen saw. Stephen saw uh, Israel in need of salvation. That's why he was preaching. Uh, from the standpoint of Israel, Israel saw Stephen as giving them heresy. He wasn't preaching the word that they, they believed in. Uh, from the standpoint of God, God was pleased with Stephen's preaching and pleased in his death and pleased in the, uh, the fact that he wanted those people forgiven. You say, how do you know that? Well, he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So you can uh, expand on that. Expository preaching requires reading the passage several times, meditating on its content until there's a clear understanding of the passage. Uh, from what we have learned in this lesson, we can be assured that this type of sermon takes much preparation. I'm teaching the book of Romans down at uh, the Bible College at Northwood, and I'm teaching verse by verse. And uh, it takes a lot of study. And uh, I want to have it right, and I want to get it right. So uh, you spend hours reading and studying the Word of God. But not only does it prepare those you're teaching, it prepares you. Mm -hmm. Now, in conclusion, expository preaching is in a great need of the hour today. Too many people are caught up in cults and have not Bible understanding. Mm -hmm. I heard a woman preacher say, saw it on video, I heard a woman preacher say, that when we come to the church to worship, that we're not there to really worship God, that God's pleased in us worshiping and being happy and taking pleasure in ourselves. That's a lie from the pits of hell. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Amen. Got to consider the source. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I posted a comment about it and I got some rebuke from some of my old friends. Well, I happen to like so-and-so. I said, well, wolves of a get uh, feather flock together. <laughs> anyway, here's your memory verse. 2 Timothy 4, 2. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for the good class. Thank you for uh, the attention of the students. I pray tonight we've been a help. God, I pray you'll bless them, you'll use them. Uh, help them to uh, build uh, the Word of God in our life and help them to build the lives of others as teachers and preachers and uh, deacons and uh, officers in the church. God, use them for your glory that Christ might be uplifted and souls might be saved. Pray now to you bless Brother Shubay as he comes in a little bit. God, uh, give him strength, give him grace, and uh, meet our need here tonight. We'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Take you about a 10-minute break. See if I can hear 15 after.